Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Resiliency Roundtables with the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. My name is Ed Fiennes, I'm the Faculty Engagement and Content Specialist for the NRC. This playlist is an interview I did with Curriculum Manager Megan Saradsky and Academic Skills Coordinator Sarah Levy for the Center for Economic and Workforce Development at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York. So we cover a lot of different topics. We talk about the classroom, we talk about curriculum design, we talk about uh, using technology, and we talk about students. The main focus of this interview will be about two contextualization, examples of contextualization that I think is a major theme throughout our consortium of schools in terms of what our teachers were trying to do. Uh, the largest bit of work that uh, is sort of encompasses all seven schools is integrating the resiliency competency model into classroom, into, into coursework, both classroom activities and out of the classroom activities lab as well, um, in, in terms of really not only identifying specifically what students can do in terms of perform in the classroom in order to demonstrate that they are resilient in some way, but also to track over time effectively as an instructor that they are in fact getting better. <laughs> they are becoming more resilient. And the resiliency competency model gives you the language to be able to not only um, build resilient activities, activities in order to that will show you clearly that the person can be resilient and would be resilient in a workplace environment, but also the language that you can use to build actual rubrics, which will clearly and transparently tell your students that they're getting better or that there's something specifically they need to work on. And of course, all of this that I'm describing should not and cannot and has not interfered with the delivery of the actual skills and content now the content knowledge and the skills that is required by the course outlines of the courses that are being taught. Now, in this particular case, we're focusing on uh, contextualizing or integrating math skills in particular, which, you know, for some of us is you actually have to have quite a bit of resiliency in order to perform it accurately time and time again, which is really where, which is really their wheelhouse, talking about both the practical, you know, how, how does a student learn how to to do math in the context in this case of learning how to uh, learning the culinary arts as well as learning how to become a, a community health worker but also how do they overcome their fear and their anxiety and their doubt self-doubt about whether they can actually do math problems which they need to be able to do in the context of their job we also discuss integrating online lessons into continuing education or non-credit uh, classwork um, or the work that they would do outside the classroom as a means to, like I was saying before, sort of introducing language that can stretch into and above and beyond simply just the lesson itself that was supplied by Smart Sparrow, at the our educational tech, our uh, basically our educational technology partner uh, here at the NRC. They built 10 different lessons using the five resiliency competencies from our competency model and students move through an interactive and adaptive space guided by an interface called DOT. So you'll hear Sarah refer to DOT. Uh, that is a sort of uh, artificial intelligence, an AI type character that serves as the as the guide and the sort of the narrative, supplies the narrative, the reason, <laughs> the sort of fictional reason why uh, the lessons exist. And then obviously there's the real reason, which is to for, for uh, students to begin to have language to be able to talk about themselves, to, for them to be able to say, I can do this, I can do that in cover letters, in, in job interviews, and be able to talk about their classwork and their coursework using that terminology. So without further ado, I'll let Sarah and Meg talk for themselves. This is Megan Saradsky and Sarah Levy from Kingsborough Community College on the Resiliency Roundtables for the Northeast Resiliency Consortium.
uh, your sort of name, job title, and what would somebody with your job title be doing if you were to describe them as resilient? What is the resilient version of your job? What does that person do? Um, so my name is Megan Saradsky, and I am the curriculum manager for the Center for Economic and Workforce Development. Um, so what does a resilient curriculum manager look like? Um, I think a lot of it is rolling with the punches. Um, so what I learned when I came to Kingsborough is that I would be sort of a jack of all trades and um, being able to maneuver, be flexible with that, um, asking a lot of questions, uh, having a backup plan and a backup to the backup plan. Um, <laughs> that has definitely helped us along the way, as Sarah can attest to. Um, the project that we've been working on has been a little over a year. Uh, and we actually have accomplished a lot, even though not everything worked the way we expected. Um, but I think we're both excited that we're on the other end of things and that you know our projects are are coming to fruition. Actually. Do you have one particular example of that sort of an unexpected sort of like, oh, this is on fire suddenly. Yeah, what do you have one of those? Um, so we were told that we had two weeks before the class would be taught, which was sort of news to us at the time. So it was sort of like, all right, Sarah, let's map out. What do we have left? Okay. Which class is this, by the oh, way? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is culinary concepts. So mm. it's uh, what we're calling Culinary Arts 9900. And it is a combination of math and cooking. Uh, and this is the project we've been working on for the last year or so. And so we were wrapping up the development of this course and really writing out the curriculum step by step. And so um, before we knew it, the class was on the books and we needed to be done and have the curriculum printed for our faculty members in a matter of two weeks. And we still had two lessons to really nail down and continue editing. And so it was just divide and conquer, talking to Sarah, getting it all done, making sure that faculty had a chance to look at it um, and then orienting them to the entire curriculum at the same time. And we did it. We got it done. I think there's a lot of teamwork and a lot of communication. Um, my name is Sarah Levy. I'm the Academic Skills Coordinator for um, NRC. Um, my role is to provide academic support in a number of different areas to um, our drug counseling students, our EMT students, our healthcare students and our culinary arts students. So I basically um, jump in and provide whatever academic support students need. So sometimes that's math support, sometimes it's writing support. Um, in terms of resiliency, we have a very, very um, diverse student population and it's kind of a mixed bag. You never know exactly who you're getting in your class. So in one class I'll have students who, you know, are just recent high school graduates. In another class I'll have students who are mainly retired from the workforce. Um, some of them have master's degrees, some of them have their GEDs. Um, so it takes a little bit of flexibility, a little resiliency to mold the <laughs> curriculum um, to this diverse population and make sure that everyone is getting maximum benefit from it, whether or not they've been out of school for 20 years, whether or not they plan on going into the workforce. Um, so just kind of jumping in, not knowing what my student population is gonna look like um, and molding the curriculum to their needs. So let's start with Carnegie. Uh, what did you guys see in the Carnegie Foundation material? Um, as, as an instructor, I will say when I first took a look at it, I thought it was an immense. Like it was the, these documents have like multiple like 4.0561, 4, 5, 6, 2. Mm -hmm. This is this gigantic document in and of itself. Um, what did you guys see? that speaks to like, oh, I have a group of students that I need, they have either a skill or a knowledge, the, 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 the skills or knowledge that they don't have, that I need to bring everybody into one spot in order for, to get them to the next class. What, was, what did you see in Carnegie that made you go, oh, this is the answer? Um, so, yes, you do need a dictionary. Uh, to get started with uh, that curriculum. Like yeah. there are just so many new words and phrases that when I was handed the curriculum, I was like, wow, what, is, what does this even mean? Um, so new terminology for what homework is, what in-class activities are and things like that. So I totally understand. Mm. Um, on my end, some of this work predates me. Um, Edgar Trout, who is our Director of Technology and Innovation here at uh, Center for Economic and Workforce Development, taught 
uh, this course, and it was uncontextualized, just as it was handed to him by Carnegie Foundation. And the students responded very positively to it. Um, if you ask him a little bit to his surprise, um, uh, you know, like some people may say that the curriculum is a little kumbaya uh, for college students, but uh, the college students respond and um, they definitely saw improvements in their math skills. So once we tested it out, it was then determining, well, how is this going to work in the NRC courses that we've been offering to our students? We have two types of students, culinary arts students and community health worker students. And they taught it a second time and found that community health worker students um, perform better in class, even with the same instructor. And the reasoning was because the material covered um, was very similar to what they were learning in their other classes. Um, okay. So that the context was in line with community health. Um, so examples of those lessons might be... What's a good example for that, Sarah? Um, so one of the lessons and one of the ones that Carnegie had had piloted for us when we went to their um, initial forum to learn more about Quantway um, was a lesson on gun violence. And it was statistics about um, gun violence and how it affects children in the United States. Um, and it allows students to learn concepts like exponents, exponential growth, which might not be that interesting to them or they might not feel as that relevant to them normally when it's uncontextualized. Um, but then when they see it in the context of, hey, learning this stuff will help me kind of make sense of the world around me, give me a little more critical thinking skills, a little more ability to sift through all of this information that comes at me on a daily basis and make sense of it, um, they bought into it a lot more. And I know that as an academic skills instructor, instructor for a course that's non-credited, they don't get any, any academic credit, they don't get a grade for my course, it's very hard to get them to buy into the math, to, to pay attention, to understand why they need it. I'm faced with a lot of, I'll never use this, I'm going into healthcare. I'll never use this, I'm going into culinary arts. So it's an uphill battle to convince them that this is actually important. Um, and when we saw the Carnegie curriculum, and we saw the lessons on citizenship and on personal finance, it really, um, it really struck us as, hey, this is a way to convince students that this stuff actually is important it, important. It is crucial to what you're going to be doing. Um, and when we piloted it in the community health class, we found that that actually really was worked out how we thought it would. And students really were interested in it. Their math skills improved and they were happy taking these lessons. They, there wasn't as much pushback as I usually have with math lessons. And the culinary arts side, we saw improvements um, in that cohort as well, but not to the same extent. It was a bigger lift to um, get students to understand that this math is actually still applicable to the field um, of interest for them. So that really, I think, weighed in for Edgar in considering, well, what if we recontextualized it and applied it specifically to the culinary field? Um, and so... That was handed off to Sarah and me, and then we kind of ran with it. And eventually that turned into developing a full course just on culinary math itself. So, I mean, was it as simple as just emptying out, like, the, for instance, the one that I've seen sort of done was that one with the with the gun violence one where you're examining. It's more sort of a critical thinking argument. Like, somebody makes an argument, can you refute this, you know, analyze. You're essentially analyzing an mm -hmm. argument. Sure. Uh, someone puts forth evidence, which is dubious, has mm -hmm. a fallacy embedded in it. Um, how was that coming up with cooking scenario? So on my side, I have a professional cooking background, so that helped. Oh. Um, but also, um, we're fortunate enough to have a fantastic faculty at Kingsborough Community College that I could just knock on their door and ask, does this make sense for this particular situation? When do students need to know this specific math? Um, one of the things I should explain, though, is that the course that we've designed at this point isn't necessarily intended to teach um, developmental math. Um, instead, it's teaching students how to apply math specifically in culinary arts. And we see that there's a, a difference in that because our students are actually still taking um, developmental math courses or traditional math courses in addition to this course that we're teaching as well. Because what we're finding is that there's a gap between the math students learn in their math courses and what they need to apply in um, their disciplinary courses. They can't bridge that gap on their own. 
So that's where this course is being inserted. In my mind, I would say, aren't you actually teaching developmental math and applied math? I mean, what's why? Walk me through the difference between those two things a little bit more. Because sure. I mean, I would imagine there's a math class that's just a math class, and then there's what you're doing. Why? Why wouldn't we just hand over the reins to you? Say you're teaching them the math. You're asking them to apply the math. Why wouldn't you be the same person that teaches it? Great question. Um, I mean, because the math that students need to know in the kitchen isn't going to cover all of the math that students would learn in a traditional or even Carnegie-based uh, developmental math course. If you take a look at our lessons, to be honest with you, I'd say the majority of what we cover are fractions, um, percents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, obviously. Mm. Um, but it doesn't really go much further beyond that. It's just many different ways of applying it. Um, in different contexts within the kitchen. So I don't think it would be enough. Um, unfortunately, I mean, we could try. We could try to create situations where students need to use math beyond that, but we're trying to be pretty realistic about what are they gonna need to know day to day in the workforce as well, um, because this is a workforce program. So uh, we're very conscious of that too. I think there's also a concern about over contextualizing um, certain math concepts. So. Um, in the Carnegie curriculum, you'll have a topic like ratios, and it'll be contextualized in different ways. You'll have a lesson on ratios in healthcare, you'll have a lesson on ratios in personal finance, ratios in healthcare, so students are able to see this concept contextualized across multiple disciplines. Um, I think one of our concerns is that having a developmental math curriculum that's so contextualized in the kitchen kind of gives students a narrow view that this math only applies in this particular context, and we want them to be able to, to branch out and understand this math concept is not just for changing the, the quantity of a recipe. This can be used to do a hundred different operations. I guess what we're saying is that the reason why you wouldn't teach this course as a developmental math course specific for food is because we're worried that students may we're worried about over contextualization that students may not be able to apply the math in any other setting besides food. Right. So um, where students may be adding their own numbers, um, one of the final assignments for this course is uh, developing a recipe and costing out that recipe. So that's something that's very specific to culinary arts. Um, they may not do that as an entry level prep cook, but down the road in the kitchen, they will need to learn how to cost out a recipe. Um, what it will take to order the food, working within a certain selling price, those kinds of things. And so that's where they really get to take ownership of that math because we're not giving them the numbers. They have to find the numbers. They have to go on a price list and take a look at vendors. How much would this cost? What's the difference between canned plum tomatoes and buying fresh plum tomatoes? Is that going to fit the selling price for my um, hypothetical restaurant that I'm working for. But even that sort of larger, I mean, because, you know, the resiliency angle of this, the sure. idea of being self-aware, just the, the the, the prep cook, you know, the line cook that's, that, again, isn't the one that's pricing out that recipe, doesn't have that responsibility ultimately, right. but understanding that that process has taken place, the Absolutely. value of the criminy mushrooms that you just went, oh, oh, whoops, I dropped those all on the sure. floor. So like, the, the, like sure. that you are going to be that much better of a worker by understanding where you are in a larger context, again, self-awareness and reflective learning. Yep, Absolutely. Absolutely. You have the food, sort of the culinary one, and then you have sort of the CHW one. I mean, is that really kind of how it comes to like sort of Quantway plus culinary and Quantway plus uh, community health worker? Or has it just been the, the community health worker one has been using what Quantway was in its original, kind of its original right, form? Right, exactly. Um, Quantway, Carnegie provided um, healthcare contextualized mm -hmm. lessons mm -hmm. um, that have been really useful. So we've stuck to the Carnegie model mm -hmm. for our community health courses, mm -hmm. but because there was no contextualized culinary lessons in the original Quant way, right. that's when Megan and I jumped in and started to contextualize our own lessons so that it was applicable to a large percentage of our student body. Are they, walk me through sort of the community health worker students in terms of what you've is, have I mean have you seen a change I mean is this is this revolutionary or is it simply you know a, a, has a more sort of a practical effect on, on on your students in terms of again just becoming better at math and understanding and, and making more a better better sort of kind of critical critical thinking choices within that sort of within that context yeah I think that they become better at math but I think the bigger battle um, that they've overcome is that they've become more open-minded towards math I think it's it's become less of a struggle to 
to open their eyes to the importance of math. When we do it with Quantway, they're much more receptive. They're interested in these lessons. Um, mm-hmm. We do a lesson on that Carnegie provided, a really great lesson on um, Tylenol overdose. We show a video about a baby who um, passed away because of a mistake with dosaging for, um, for children's Tylenol versus regular Tylenol. Mm-hmm. And then students see this and they go, wow, Numbers really actually make a difference here. And then we step backwards and we talk about how these numbers were calculated. And then you've got them. And once you've gotten them to buy into it, the the actual process, the math itself, becomes more palatable to them. Mm -hmm. Um, They're more receptive. And I think most of the issue with students learning math is that it's their fear. It's they, they don't open up to it because they're just convinced that, A, it's not relevant, but B, it's something they've never been good at. It's something that they never will be able to be good at. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that Quantway has really helped overcome that problem. Is there uh, an, I mean, are, um, in terms of practice, sort of role play, in terms of where you have a, you know, a client that you're working with, uh, has has there ever been scenarios run where they are using, uh, literally applying their math in their other, do you know if they've done that in other in sort of other work that they're doing in community health worker that the other community health worker instructors are are seeing them demonstrate like again walking through I, like student A plays the role of a young mother who is who has a the, a colicky child or is feverish and doesn't you know again is worried about giving Tylenol and stuff like that and the community health worker then has to explain the math like are you having your students turning around and practicing the teaching of applied math because that sounds like in my mind that's what the community health worker has to go out and do right and I think that when it comes to their other community health classes um, they're a lot better equipped to to deal with uh, statistics that they're being given. So they learn about mm-hmm. HIV statistics, HIV rates, and they're able to say, hey, we learned this lesson um, about percentage growth. Mm-hmm. And this looks like a percentage growth uh, question that's mm-hmm. coming up. But instead of dealing with um, rates of hepatitis, we're now dealing with rates of HIV. And they are able to translate it. So the context is very similar, mm-hmm. but the numbers change. And a lot of times for students, even that's a problem. You, t- you give them a problem, they understand it, you change the numbers, all of a sudden it's like a foreign foreign concept to them. Mm-hmm. And we see that they are able to translate what they're learning in Quantway to mm-hmm. the work that they're doing in their community health courses. So we found that was pretty successful. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really on... it's. When you think about it, it kind of, when you're thinking about it as we're talking about it, it, it feels where well, you're talking about empowerment. You're moving towards it's. The, I mean, it's the kind of thing that on the, sort of the liberal arts side of things, usually the discussion is about you know becoming a reader, becoming a writer, you know, and understanding your world around you and understanding the letters that come to you in the mail, the under, reading the newspaper and understanding what's happening in your town, in your community, or whatever. Being able to write a politician, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. That really w- what these what they are actually becoming empowered to do is to empower their community and the idea i mean this may it may sound a little highfalutin but like the you know or kumbaya or whatever but like the the idea that mathematics would be something as again as simple as like dosages of medicine mm-hmm. sure you know like you're preventing a crisis of, of of a fatal crisis just by understanding Fractions. I mean, is that kind of thing crossed your mind? I mean, like, has has anyone as a conversa- has that conversation come up in in kind of what you guys when you're talking to instructors or students or people you know just sort of in this now sort of community that you've sort of created here? Absolutely. Um, I know that the community health professors have brought it to my attention that there's um, an understanding of things like when they'll say in a ten mile radius there are X number of cases of this. Um, disease. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, students, even if they're not calculating, they know what that means. They can visualize what a 10 mile radius means. So it's exactly what you were saying about being able to understand the mail, the newspaper, things that are flooding you all the time, this information. Mm-hmm. We're being flooded with numbers all the time, whether or not we realize it. And if a student can start the course and, and hear a 10 mile radius and really not be able to visualize what that means and end the course with just an idea in their head of a circle and what a radius represents, even if they can't do the in-depth calculations, um, it's a victory. It's a big step that they've taken. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I mean, are you guys now um, advocates of teaching this sort of uh, teaching math 
this way only. I mean, we talked about the difference between a traditional math class and what you guys are doing and what the, the job, maybe kind of the job of that of that instructor versus what you guys are doing. But is there a case to be made? Again, Carnegie is seemingly making it with the, again, that immense, this immense project that they've, with the, the Quantway stuff, the Quantway lessons or whatever, that is this the way you're supposed to teach math? I mean, Sarah and I, when we got your questions and we were reviewing, you know, potential responses, that's a question that came up for us. And we were discussing that, like, could it be taught this way? Could all math courses be taught this way? Mm -hmm. um, and Standardized test is now. I mean, the new yeah. SAT is entirely, almost entirely statistics and finance mm -hmm. now. And, so. you know, I don't... I don't really have a good answer for that. And I, I wish that I did. I think that, um, you know, the student population that I work with specifically, it's a big eye opener for them. Um, if you're talking about empowerment, I think that there are a lot of students that feel unempowered or disempowered, if those are even words, um, by math, um, that the learning experience is taken away from them because they don't feel like they're a part of the math conversation. As soon as they feel like it's not for them, it's not about them, it's not interesting to them, or they're not good at it. So it's really hard to reach students um, when they get to that point and to re-empower them and say, no, hey, wait a second, like this is important for you to know. Um, and you know, math is a tool that you can always keep in your toolbox and it's going to help you succeed. And we sort of have to start from the beginning and explain to them why and uh, give them those applications. And so it's a little bit of going backwards to move forward, but um, what I'm wondering is, really, after students are exposed to the courses that Sarah and I have been working on, what they're, how they're going to do in their non-contextualized math courses afterwards. Um, that's something that one of the professors approached us about is, you know, let's say that students complete this culinary arts, uh, culinary concepts course. Um, you know, is that going to make them feel more confident in themselves and their math abilities, even when they go to a traditional math course afterwards? Um, are they going to be able to make those relationships between math and culinary on their own, or math and the world on their own? Um, so, I don't know, those are really interesting things to research and look into. Yeah, I mean, the going is, you know, it's again, I, so much of what in sort of interpersonal kinesthetic learning, especially we're talking about what, uh, of someone who works with food, someone mm -hmm. who works with their hands, that they are actively, again, the applied math in the most, the strongest, you know, application, literally putting right. it in your hands. Mm -hmm. That like, to, to have them sit in, you know, in front of a PowerPoint presentation or, you know, having them work problems on the board and just having to sometimes quite literally sit on their hands. Like there's nothing to the war like right. the the idea that, that, that by st i'm worried that by taking it away there it's you're taking it out of the context that they succeeded in sure you know and that's differentiated learning the conversations been happening for 20 30 years that's right. yeah yeah so um is there any are there any particular stories you can change the names to you know protect the innocent if you feel but i'd, I'd love to hear a a, a student story of, of you know that really sort of speaks to what you guys are talking about um, so I just completed, um, we just piloted our first NRC culinary concepts course for this summer. It was an uh, accelerated class. It was six weeks as opposed to the traditional 12 week class. Um, well, was that just a time constraint? I mean, was that, was, is that also being tested whether six weeks is enough, is, is too much or not enough or um, I think that our hope was that our pilot would be in the, the standard 12-week class, but because NRC runs a summer module that's accelerated, mm -hmm. um, this was kind of given to us a couple of weeks before, and here, let's make this work in six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to condense it. We did a little playing around with it. Um, and Megan and I had developed a pre- and post-assessment test mm -hmm. for the students. Um, uncontextualized math, fractions, decimals, and percents. We give it to them on the first day. We let them know this is not graded. This is not going to count towards you, against you in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give them the exact same exam on the last day of class to see what kind of progress they've made. Um, and I had one particular student who, um, extremely introverted, uh, handed in the paper at the end of the, the first at the end of the assessment, I gave them an hour. She was the last one to hand it in, handed it to me, and had one answer written in out of 35 questions and 34 blank questions. Um, and wasn't able to vocalize to me what, what was wrong, never asked a question in class, um, 
just really I wasn't sure where, where the disconnect was, if there was a learning disability involved. Um, always took down notes, sat in the front, was there for every single class. And the last day of class, I, re, um, I gave them the, the post assessment and she got 26 out of 35 questions right wow. and I never heard her voice the whole semester but she <laughs> handed that in and I and I was floored um so she was taking it all in in her own way but to me that was probably the biggest success that I've seen since um I started teaching for NRC cool yeah any anybody on the food side that that comes to mind um actually I'll be teaching uh this fall. So I haven't had an opportunity to work directly with students yet, but I have had an opportunity to sit in and observe Sarah teach. And, um, I mean, it was, I was just thrilled. I was totally thrilled just to see what we've been working on for so long come to fruition to see, uh, you know, people in the seats and how students to respond. And that first day that I sat in, I was completely nervous. I was like, are students going to walk out the door as soon as they find out that this is a math course and they're in culinary and all they want to do is work with food. And the students were great. They were receptive. Um, they sat in, they asked a lot of uh, really fascinating questions. They became totally engaged in the math. And um, what kind of question? I mean, again, I'm, maybe yeah. I'm thinking of my own math classes, like questions in a math class. Aren't they typically? I don't get it. I don't what is do it again. Do it. Can you do another problem? Sure. Like, like what? What kind of interesting questions are coming? Up? Um, so I'm trying to think of which court, which classes I sat in on. Um, well, obviously, some of them were disciplinary specific questions um, and some of them weren't um, were math specific questions and one of the lessons that I sat in on was um, unit conversion for um, transitioning from weight to volume and vice versa. And so students had a lot of questions about um, what kind of scales to use, what is the difference, um, cups versus teaspoons and, and those kinds of things. And does it, does it really make a difference if you have a quarter teaspoon versus a half teaspoon of an ingredient? Like, when we get to the nitty gritty, to what extent is math really going to have an impact on the final product of what gets on a dish? And so for students, I to be open to the fact that it makes a huge difference, especially in something like baking. Baking, I was just which, supposed to say, your yeah. bakers yes. know, like, absolutely not, good Lord. Yeah. You can serve a rock or you can serve a flan. It, like, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, it makes a huge difference. And, and so that's where they can really have fun with the math too. Um, I mean, one of the lessons that we designed, which we haven't tested yet, but I hope to do it this semester, is um, for students to uh, take a recipe for chocolate chip cookies and they'll be tasked with changing um, the number of, sorry, the yield basically. So let's say it goes from 24 to, I don't know, um, 50. Okay. Oh. Uh, so something really challenging. And for them to do the math on their own and then to bake it. And that, that baking it question. is going to be, you know, um, the opportunity for them to check their math in like a very mm. physical way because it makes a difference if you use a little bit too much butter or not enough sugar or, um, you know, uh, if any kind of change in the ingredient can really change the finish. Product. How is the kitchen? Uh, this is just sort of a practical thing for, you know, anyone who'd be listening who wants to do something like this. How is the kitchen time associated? Is there lab time associated with the class? There is. There is lab time. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Um, so this summer when Sarah piloted the course, she uh, co-taught with another um, professor, Dave Clark. Actually, two professors. Um, she's, she taught two cohorts. Um, so Dave Clark and um, Mark D'Alessandro. And so typically, um, for one professor, she would teach the first hour and a half of the course, and the other professor would take the second hour and a half. And then the next uh, day during that week, the professor would take the whole three hours for lab as well. So there was a lot of back and oh, forth wow. with lab. So it's pretty extensive. And the professors incorporated as much math into uh, the kitchen exercises as possible. Um, and I think there were kind of two reasons for that. One was, um, again, that application focus. But the other one was um, a little bit of concern if students would show up if they knew that one day was just math and the next day <laughs> was just cooking. And there's a part of me that, you know, understands that. Like, I kind of get that. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be cha like tweaking um, that ratio of math to culinary, um, trying to lean more towards math uh, as we go on. But is there, I mean, is there allowances like you can bring a calculator to the kitchen? I mean, are they using their phones? Like, what is the, what is the, 
new norm now for the, I mean, like, what is the norm that you're establishing with your students in terms of workplace and math? Um, so yes, they can bring their calculators because any kitchen, you're going to have a calculator. Yeah. So, oh, um, wow. okay. yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously you can use your phone too, but, um, you know, a lot of chefs don't like people to use their phones cause they're dirty. Mm. Um, although a calculator isn't necessarily going to be that much cleaner. Um, but, so, uh, a machine that stays in the, yes. the, the space that never leaves the space is probably at least a little bit more hygienic, right. sanitary. Right. I, I think like the biggest thing that kind of stumped us for a second was um, students asking us, do you really need to know the conversions of teaspoons to tablespoons when I can just ask Google? Um, so that was a really interesting one because we were like, yes, you can Google anything. And we were like, why do students need to memorize this? I mean, obviously because it's faster, but you know, students are like, well, I could do it really fast. Watch me. So we kind of went back and forth and back and forth. And a lot of it, if we're talking about technology and, and calculators, we can also talk about technology and computers in the kitchen. And for the most part, there's one computer in the kitchen. And that's going to be the executive chef's computer. And no, he doesn't want you to be touching his computer to look yeah. up how many You're teaspoons mush, mush, are in the tablespoons. Like, no <laughs> yeah, to, uh, exactly. No. Um, and then Especially you, if it's in the middle of a, a rush uh, of right. some kind. You are, you have, it would be that much more beneficial to have. And yeah. that's a cool conversation to have with students because it's another way of explaining to them how the kitchen works. Or, yeah. you know, like, why can't I use my phone? Well, because, you know... Um, Restaurants aren't going to use prime real estate uh, for the kitchen. So most likely you're going to be working in a basement where there's no cell phone reception. So you're not going to have and internet or shoulder Google. To shoulder with yeah. a bunch of other, like that's, <laughs> I mean, has that, has anyone ever, I mean, that's, it, it sounds like a great opportunity. Um, uh, again, maybe it's just because I have a theater background. I keep thinking about this kind of thing. It's like, all right, you, everyone has to be like, you're actually giving the math test in the kitchen where they, it's like, you have 30 seconds to, to do, to fit, convert this or whatever, because again, you may have to convert it in right. under under fire. So right. just like CHW, like you're maybe coaching clients to be difficult to practice with the students, you know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That like that's that just, frankly just, just sounds like a fun class to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm really I'm looking forward to uh, September 14th, my first class. And, and you know, like it, it's going to be fun. What is it about, I guess we'll begin back where we started with Carnegie, what, what is it about what Smart Sparrow, what we've been talking about with Smart Sparrow, kind of made your sort of your pedagogical ears perk up and go, oh wait, that's something that might be kind of interesting to do. I'm looking at Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> As you want. Um, I think that, so we're always trying to work, obviously, resiliency into the curriculum and students have a resiliency course that they take weekly. Um, but we haven't really found a way to contextualize it into the academic portion. Um, so when Smart Sparrow approached us with their um, interactive dot lessons, mm -hmm. um, I did one of the lessons. It was a lesson on flexibility, um, and I found that it was just fun. It was a really fun lesson to do. Um, and I said to myself, you know, my students, I don't give mandatory homework assignments most of the time, but this is an assignment that I think – um, will benefit them. I'll be able to work into my lessons because now I can discuss flexibility and I'll have some idea um, where they are because I can see the results of what they're doing on my end. Mm -hmm. um, and then we thought about all different ways we could work this topic of flexibility into what we're doing in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talked about the different kinds of flexibility. Flexibility in terms of thinking outside of the box, flexibility in terms of being able to switch between tasks. And these are things that culinary students have to do on a regular basis. This is crucial. Um, and so we said to ourselves, how are we going to relate this to their final project, for example, when they have to come up with a menu and cost a menu? Um, well, what if they need to buy plum tomatoes, but they happen to not be in season and they're way too expensive. How do I think about outside of the box and find alternatives to that? Mm -hmm. Or I have, I'm making an eggs Benedict, which is the final project for their um, culinary one course. They have to actually cook the eggs Benedict. And so I have to make sure that I'm poaching my eggs correctly and my sauce isn't splitting and all these different elements are in play at the same time. It requires a ton of flexibility. So mm -hmm. we said this would really be um, a good way to, to merge those two concepts. Unfortunately, we weren't able to um, test out the dot lesson for this past uh, mm -hmm. cohort because it was too short. But our hope is that in the fall, um, we'll give the students these lessons, they'll be able to use it, and then we can work it into there. When you said fun, can you describe again, because we don't have visual aids, you know, what, 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 
what what is fun? What made it fun? What, sure. What... Um, so I remember specifically one exercise where I think it was a cardboard box, and you were asked to come up with all of the uses of a cardboard box that you could think of mm-hmm. um, in, I think, a course of a minute or something like that. And I think that in school, we're very used to there being right answers and wrong answers. And so I started thinking about what's a right answer of what you could do with a cardboard box. You can keep shoes in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you can ship a package in it. And then it was like, well, I can use it for my cat's litter box if I want to. Mm -hmm. I can wear it as a really fun hat. Like all these different things and there's (laughs) no wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And that makes it fun because everything I'm saying is correct and I can think about whatever I want. And it was just like a cool exercise, I thought. I mean, and again, where we were the first half of the conversation talking about, again, I don't know, you know, how far, into getting into the empowerment thing that, you know, this is really about somebody gaining access to something that maybe for a really long time they were either actually told they can't do or somehow believed because no one interrupted them and said, no, you can do this. It's like, no, I just can't do math. I just want to do math. Right. You know, fear the anxiety that comes with, with, with numbers. That like this, what you're, what you're kind of describing is also, again, something that, you know, instructor after instructor and after instructor who is really succeeding with the resiliency development side of things just has students play mm-hmm. like that that the idea of play of discovery i mean it really is just i mean the the, the asking or having teachers discover that if they stop like almost kind of stop teaching mm-hmm. and that they they kind of fold their arms and 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 ref, kind of refuse in some ways that their their students are finding themselves they're they're finding themselves more than they're just finding sort of abstract skills and knowledge mm-hmm. that like that self discovery thing has come back again and again and it sounds like that that's kind of what you're talking about yeah and i i think that that's a big part of the productive struggle that that carnegie always talks about the importance mm-hmm. of the productive struggle of at some point the teacher saying I- i'm stepping back and now you learn and you work your way out of this problem. You figure it out. Mm. Um, and I think there's a huge amount of value to that. Mm. Is there, um, I mean, there's more than just sort of, I mean, the flexibility lesson is in and of itself. I mean, how long did it take? I mean, how much time did you spend? It was like 20, 30 minutes kind of yeah, getting cover to cover? About 30 minutes. So the, um, each one of them presumably is, you know, set up to do 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Do you, so you see it as something that is done outside of class? So it's it's sort of like a homework assignment that you do and then you come back. I mean, are you are you imagining it sort of discussed openly like or is it just to get some analytics back to the instructor? I mean, is it, is it going to be an op- excuse me, an open conversation? Um, I about think how it went. I think that um, it won't be because unfortunately the the time there are time restraints sure. with the curriculum there's a lot of material that we have to get in so my hope was that students would do this lesson and then I would be able to sprinkle the vocabulary mm-hmm. um, throughout our culinary concepts lesson so now I could refer to the various types of flexibility without necessarily saying let's talk about this lesson that you worked through mm-hmm. I can say we're in the kitchen and I'd like you to s- give me an example of how you would show this type of flexibility and mm-hmm. they'll have that foundation because they'll have taken the lesson What's a little tricky is with the with the continuing ed population, with the NRC population, um, these students are coming from very different walks of life, and I've noticed that um, it's considerably different than the credit side of the college in terms of students' comfort with technology and their mm-hmm. access to technology. Um, so in a number of courses, the assumption has been these guys have access to the computer, and we're going to use Blackboard, we're gonna put stuff up on the computer, and then we have students come to our office and say, are you gonna give us lab hours because I don't have access to a computer at home, or I can't print this material at home. So it's been a little bit tricky. We've tried to find time for them, um, just with all of the NRC courses, tried to find them lab hours where they could be supervised, um, have access to a printer, but we can't make the assumption that these students all are going to be able to access online material without making some allowances for how they can do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you, do you see this again, what, what, what smart Sparrow has been talking to me, you know, you know, sort of the Newlands, Heather and Amanda have been talking to me about is, you know, when, when, when we all get really excited about this project, it usually speaks about sort of grander terms that like, this could really change something Mm -hmm. because I mean, uh, talk to us a little bit about sort of the dot sort of AI 
kind of idea that like there's this little blinking dot in that's going to run through all 10 flexibility being one of them uh lessons that is learning you know is there you know is that something that could become something else you know is is that is you know you think of like the movies you know movie technology in the 70s you know the clash of the titans you know sort of like mm -hmm. stop animation you know that you know where we are now with CGI. Like, is is this is this going to be the sort of walking skeleton in Clash of the Titans that becomes something that's so again so ubiquitous? You know, is is I mean, like, is it is it is it kind of poking at that sort of that sort of like future-minded instructor? I think that it is. I think that there's a lot of kind of fear to overcome before we get there. So Whose fear do you think? I mean, again, I, I think instructors have a, a, such a very almost, it's it's an almost an impossible situation. It's like instructors have to be the brave. Like someone can come up with a great idea and students have a bunch of needs. It's like we're the ones that have to negotiate this. Right. So it's like, well, we we I don't really get any of this stuff, and I somehow have to transport it into the sort of you know the students because somebody told me they need it, and like, well, I don't even understand it yet. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I think that with teachers um, across the board, there's there's um they get comfortable with their way of teaching with certain um, tools that they rely on, and I know I felt the same way. I was very hesitant about this lesson, mm -hmm. um, about the first dot lesson that we went through, the flexibility lesson, and even though. I thought it was great and I, I enjoyed it. I'm still hesitant about things like, how am I gonna fit this in? Where, how am I gonna get students to buy into this? Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential for it, but I think that you're right, that as teachers, we really have to pave the way and, and get students um, on board with it. So I think that breaking um, down a little bit of teacher fear and breaking them out of their comfort zone a little bit mm -hmm. um, would make a huge difference. Like you had said, the the that there are there is the sort of the credit size students that are um, acculturated with technology more so than than some of the sort of service workers that the NRC is sort of or soon to be service workers that the NRC is dealing with. I'd love to sort of end the conversation, kind of talking about students again, um, about you know who are the who are the students that have been coming in. Um, you know, at Kingsboro, it's really been a mixed bag. Um, diversity on every level. Um, so we have very young students. Um, what would you say is the youngest student that you've worked with, Sarah? 21. 21. 21. Okay. Um, so 21 year olds, and we also have a number of career changers. Um, we had a student uh, that was in Sarah's cohort over the summer. Um, who was a little bit older, I'd say in his 60s or so. Um, so it really does run the gamut. Um, also in terms of experience, we have students that have never worked before. And then we have students, I think it was a couple of cohorts ago, that was a professor and um, do you remember, it was a science background, I believe, and was changing tracks to want to work in culinary arts. So um, that's fascinating. It's, it's interesting. I mean, each student lends their experience to the learning environment. Um, and so the way that I see it is it's a benefit for everyone in the classroom. Um, but it's also a challenge. You know, it keeps professors on their toes. Um, you know, like if I were tasked with teaching a class where I had a neuroscience professor sitting in front of me and I'm teaching fractions and decimals, would I be a little bit nervous? Absolutely. Um, but I think another way to see it is that this is a person that can um, can only add to that learning environment and is going to lend um, their background to what this course is going to look like as we work our way through the semester. Um, it's going to take the course into a variety of different directions. They're going to think about culinary or math in a way that maybe no one else in the classroom is. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, if we're talking about resiliency, we're talking about flexibility um, for professors and for students. And I, I think that goes with, you know, talking about technology and Smart Sparrow as well. Um, so, yeah, definitely testing our resiliency. Yeah. And I think that different, different factors affect the kind of population we get for different cohorts. Like, mm -hmm. for example, for a summer cohort, which was accelerated, we saw students who are a little bit older and students who are really, really serious because they had to dedicate probably 30 hours a week 
throughout the summer on a beautiful campus. They had to come pass right by the beach and go into a classroom and be in a classroom almost eight <laughs> hours a day. Right. So we saw very, very serious students because they were they were showing up in this beautiful weather as opposed to maybe a more stretched out cohort that takes place when weather isn't so nice, when everyone is back to school and it's like, hey, my friends are all going back to school, back to work, maybe I should be doing something. Sure. So different different factors affect the kind of population we get. But in general, like Megan said, it's a really, really mixed bag. Um, a couple more questions. Again, we kind of went to students. Now I'd love to kind of come back to you guys to sort of do completely full circle. Um, working with the NRC, can you name um, one thing that you might have actually learned about yourself? If self-discovery is is a, a possible theme for what the you know when we start talking about the NRC and wrapping it up as sort of the end of this grant, what do you think you've learned about yourself either as an educator or even as a person that that the NRC but your work with the NRC is somehow sort of sparked? I think that I've learned that um, there is. I have something to teach any group of students. And I think that was hard for me at first when I found out that I was going to be teaching a KSAC class where it's a drug counseling class. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of thrown in there. And I said, I, I have nothing to, these are mostly um, career changers in the KSAC program. They're mainly older people. Um, I said, I don't have anything to teach them, but things then, then you learn that really, as long as you're passionate about it, as long as you're willing to help, their students will learn from you. And I found ways to, to get material across to them. I taught them about study skills. Um, I taught them about research, about how to be a really good, effective reader. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I have more resources than I thought that I had coming into this, to this grant. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to deflect for a second. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> All right, Very and this good. is why. Adaptable. So, right? <laughs> um, because I think also a really interesting question is, what do you learn about your colleagues in the process of doing this work? And so sure. um, it's been really cool to work with Sarah and to design lessons with her. And all of this is on pen and paper and computers and whatever. And we have this theoretical, you know, approach to what this is going to look like in the classroom. And then over the summer to see her actually teach it. And I'm going to out you, Sarah. Your background is not culinary. Um, it's math. <laughs> so to watch a math instructor teach this hybrid culinary math course and to see how well she was able to work with the students. I mean, I wouldn't have known that she was she didn't have a culinary background because she clearly was like listening to me, asking me a lot of questions, logging it in her brain. So when she was teaching in front of students, it was like it was masterful. And that was so cool. Oh, and like thank you. I'm so nervous about teaching in the fall because I got to see her do it and I was like, I don't know that I could do it like that. So um but maybe that brings me to my next point, which mm -hmm. is that um similar to what Sarah said is we all come into the classroom or into our work world uh, with different skill sets. No, I'm not going to teach this course like Sarah did. And that's okay because um, I bring a different set of tools with me. Um, and so my lesson isn't going to look the way that Sarah taught it. Um, my student population is going to be very different from the student population that, student, that Sarah worked with. Um, and I'm okay with that. I'm open to that. Um, you know, my background is in culinary arts and um, also workforce development. So I'm going to rely on that while still getting the same concepts across. Um, so uh, it's going to be the same material, just uh, with the own, my own flavor added to it. And um, so that's what I'm learning about myself. Yeah. And that's, I think, why I think so much of, the, again, the good stuff that we seem to be finding uh, is because it is at the community college level because you will have a diversity of instructors mm -hmm. that you, uh, you know, if, if only just thinking about the sort of adjunct part-time, you know, on both sides, both, you know, sort of credit side and sort of tr traditionally called continuing education. There's lots of different ways, you know, to talk about it. Um, uh, but that sort of these are people from other jobs, have other jobs that do other things. You know, quite often they are teaching the thing that they do. Like again, EMT being probably the most prevalent of that where it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. they come off the ambulance, they walk into a classroom and they're talking about what they did, you know, right. what just happened to them. So like that's that, uh, the, what people are learning, you know, again, as, as, as when we put them into, especially again, talking about workforce, workforce about where we're putting them into a classroom where they are, in and of themselves, we're asking them to reflectively learn 
while they're teaching is right. one of the like is something that I I I don't want to necessarily codify, but I want to sort of present that as part of sort of the end of this project. It wasn't just students and data and grades right. and retention completion. It really was about changing you know changing people's lives. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Thank you for doing what you do because I know you've changed a whole bunch of lives. <laughs> thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. permanent location for all of our work, including the work discussed here, would be our skillscommons.org page, I guess for lack of a better term, our, the section of skillscommons.org that is dedicated entirely to all of our materials. Uh, we'll have uh, all sorts of things, including all of the audio files from all of these resiliency roundtables, as well as our tools, our charts, our, uh, there will be literature there, there will be uh, examples of lessons there, there's all sorts of things um, that are going to stay there, that's going to be there permanently. So um, if you like what you hear and you're interested in, to, in how we were working with the concept of resiliency in training service workers and community college students uh, here on the East Coast, please wander around our Skills Commons page. Uh, it's skillscommons.org. You should the search feature should get you there pretty quickly. Um, and while you're here, please wander around uh, the playlists. Here you will find uh, lots of amazing people talking about their really amazing work. We have uh, administration, we have college presidents, we have staff, we have teachers. Uh, basically, everybody that makes up our uh, of the the work that we've done here, our projects. So. The, do not hesitate to take a listen to pretty much everything that we have here. It is, in my personal opinion, as the faculty engagement and content specialist here, that it is, it is the, if not one of, it's the best way to learn about how uh, how this how this all worked, how resiliency really made it into uh, the classroom and really had an impact on people's lives in terms of their ability to get and keep their jobs. So, uh, for the rest of the Northeast Resiliency Consortium, my name is Ed Fiennes, and we'll see you here soon.